All right, everybody. So we're going to be moving on with our study of water. Remember, we're not really covering the water cycle here, but the different properties of water. Okay, so we already talked about a water molecule and those different types of bonds within the, within the molecule, as well as those hydrogen bonds that connect one water molecule to another. Now what we're going to look at is those properties of that water molecule and how they allow water to do the things that water does that really makes life as we know it possible. All right, so let's take a look at this. Uh, if you just want to call this one uh, properties of water, that's fine. And the previous one was just like the water molecule itself. Let's get into uh, properties of water here. And again, feel free to pause this and rewind it as needed, because uh, I'm sure I will go too fast at times when you need to get some things written down. Okay, so. First off, cohesion. So here's your definition. Please write this down. Cohesion is the attraction between particles of the, say, of the same substance. So water is cohesive. It shows cohesion. Other things can be cohesive as well, as long as it's an attraction to itself. That's cohesion. Okay? Now, here's an example of cohesion. All right, this is a, a metal called mercury. Mercury is actually a liquid at room temperature. If you've ever seen any of the Terminator movies um, with the, the liquid metal, they're really making it look like that's how mercury would work. And mercury, as you can see here, when it's poured onto a tabletop, would rather stick to itself and kind of form a little dome or a little ball on top of the table rather than flatten out on the table. So it would rather stick to itself. It's extremely cohesive. Mercury would make bonds to other atoms of mercury. Okay, here's some examples of cohesion with water. I showed you this in the previous video as well. If you look over here in the top right hand picture, those are drops of water on a penny. And as you can see, the water is attracted to itself and makes that dome. And like we said, if you keep putting drops on there, eventually the force of gravity uh, becomes greater because you're putting more mass on there and it overcomes the force of cohesion. Okay, same thing with this water strider insect. It's not wet. It's resting on that cohesion. Okay, you guys remember why water sticks to itself. It's the hydrogen bonding. It's the positive H of one water attracted to the negative O of a nearby water. It's like a very weak refrigerator magnet. Okay, but it's enough to allow these things to happen. And then we also talked about this bottom left picture pouring a glass of milk or water so high it's above the rim of the glass, that's because of the cohesion. Sometimes this is called surface tension. Okay, so let's get a few things written down here. So your number one property of water is cohesion. Okay, there's the definition. And you need to know why. This is the why of cohesion. Okay, like why does it happen? So please write that down. This occurs because water molecules form hydrogen bonds with nearby water molecules. If you want to draw yourself a little picture of this, just so that you understand what's going on here, I'll draw a little picture down here. Remember, water is polar. So this hydrogen would be attracted to a nearby oxygen of a different water molecule. And you had to do that in that one properties of water packet as well. That's the hydrogen bonds right here. That's your hydrogen bonds right there. Remember. These bonds here within one water molecule, what are they called? Those are the covalent bonds. If you didn't know that, you need to be looking over your notes a little bit each night. Okay, and, and like I said, most people would call this surface tension. Okay. The second property of water. Now, guys, I know I'm going a little quick, so feel free to pause it. It's called adhesion. You've heard a word like this before, if you've ever heard of an adhesive, like adhesive tape or a glue is an adhesive. An adhesive binds together two things that are not the same. That's what adhesive or what adhesion is, okay? So adhesive tape, like duct tape or something like that, it binds the backing of the tape to whatever you're taping it to, okay? So it's that glue on the inside of the tape is binding the plastic part of the tape to whatever you're taping, that's adhesion because you're connecting to unlike things, okay? So here's your definition here, attraction between two different substances. 
And water can exhibit adhesion to other things that are polar. Okay? So we'll kind of jot that in here. We'll say water, and I'll just make this into a, a verb here, adheres to other polar molecules. So water can only exhibit adhesion <clears throat> to other molecules that have positive and negative ends. Okay? And here's the why. Why is it able to do adhesion? Like what's going on at a molecular level? Well, here we go. Again, this time the water will make hydrogen bonds to those other polar molecules. Okay? Now, some things that are polar um, would be anything that water can dissolve. Okay? So sugars, salts, things like that, those have positive and negative ends to them. Um, glass is another example of something that's polar. So if you take a shower and you get out and the mirror has fog all over it, that's because the steam from your shower adhered to that glass. <laughs> adhered to that glass. <clears throat> and that's what you're seeing there. In these pictures here, you can see water adhering these little droplets to the spider's web. <clears throat> and can also adhere to different plants and things like that. Now, water cannot adhere to things that are nonpolar. Okay? Nonpolar things are things like oils, waxes, fats, things like that. That's why with the, with the Italian dressing bottle, you have to shake it every time you're going to use it because the oil on top will not mix with the water on the bottom because the oil is nonpolar and the water is polar. So water will not make hydrogen bonds to that, okay? Because remember, to make a hydrogen bond, you have your negative oxygen covalently bonded to your two hydrogens. They have a slight positive charge because of that uh, unequal sharing of those uh, shared electrons. And to make a hydrogen bond, this has to be attracted to some negative, or this needs to be attracted to some positive. Same thing down here, okay? But with a nonpolar, there are no positives and negatives in it. So water can't do anything with it. That's why if you wax a car, the water beads on the surface. It won't flatten out because water cannot adhere to that wax. Okay? And we'll, we're going to do a lab, and we'll take a look at some of that stuff too. We'll do some experiments of some stuff that you've already seen, but now you'll understand why it's happening. Okay, so water exhibits cohesion and adhesion. Okay. Water also, this will be your number three, demonstrates something called capillary action. Capillary action is when water molecules move up a thin glass tube. Okay? So, we'll do this in lab as well. But over here on this little animation, you can see that the water level is right here. Okay? But in the straw, it's going up to here. Okay? And that's what capillary action is. Okay, the water molecules move up inside that glass tube. All right, now we got to know why. So this is why. Why does water do capillary action? Two forces, adhesion and cohesion working together. Some water molecules adhere by doing hydrogen bonds to the inside of that glass tube because the glass is polar. So they kind of go on the inside. Now, they're also doing cohesion to the water in the container, and they're pulling that up the middle, okay? So that's how adhesion and cohesion work together to can move water up into something like this capillary tube. Now, obviously, it's not going to go all the way up that tube that, in that animation and kind of go out of the top, and you guys know why. Gravity. That point that that water is going up to is where the force of gravity is able to overcome this adhesion and cohesion we call capillary action. And that's why it only goes up there so far. Okay, so water is able to do cohesion, adhesion, capillary action, which is a combination of adhesion and cohesion when water moves up a small uh, glass tube or any kind of polar tube. Now, a question you might be asking yourself is, who cares about capillary action? I mean, 
when am I ever going to put a small glass tube into water? And so that, that would be a good point. Capillary action, here's a great example. If you have a tree in your yard, let's say it's 20 feet tall, you know trees don't have hearts. So how is that water getting from those roots all the way up to the leaves all the way up on the top? There's no pump. There's no heart. There's nothing like that. Gravity is going to fight that water all the way. So how is it getting up there? It's getting up there through capillary action. Okay. So in the roots, there are just thin tubes of plant tissue. Okay. It's actually called xylem. And that continues into the stem and into the leaves. And it has these little openings on the underside of the leaf. So what a plant does is it allows water to leave. In the water cycle, we call that transpiration. When it allows water vapor to leave, what happens is it moves some water up a little higher, up a little higher, moves it up the stem, up the stem from the roots, draw more in from the soil. It's capillary action. Okay, think of plants as having tiny straws that are continuous from their roots up their stem to their leaves, and they open up at the leaves, and that's how plants can draw water into themselves is through capillary action. Okay, uh, in your body, you have arteries that bring oxygenated blood away from your heart and it goes to all of the tissues of your body. Those arteries get smaller and smaller until they become capillaries. Capillaries allow your water-based blood to seep into your tissues. And there's other capillaries that can draw it in just like that picture of the straw in the water and then collect that all into veins and that all comes back up to your heart again. So we even have little blood vessels called capillaries that do a very similar thing in our body. Okay, so capillary action. Okay, fourth property of water is heat capacity. Now, students struggle with this. So this is going to take a little bit extra of your time to kind of get this into your brain and please ask me some questions if you're not quite understanding it, okay? There's two parts to heat capacity, okay? So first we're going to talk about is called specific heat. Specific heat is something that scientists calculate for pretty much everything we can, any kind of material. And it's how much heat you need to raise the one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Now, why is it one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius? Because they needed to standardize it. They needed to have some way to measure this. Okay? So, something like a metal would have a very low specific heat. It doesn't take much energy or much heat to raise a gram of a metal by one degree Celsius. Okay? Uh, something like sand is the same way. Okay, you could walk across the sand at the beach and it's burning your feet. It didn't take a whole lot of sunlight to really get that temperature up to make you uncomfortable on the bottom of your feet. Okay? Water has a very high heat capacity. What that means, it takes an awful lot of energy to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius, okay? And it means water resists temperature changes. Like the guy in the crash course video said, you know, if you ever put a pot of water on to make spaghetti or mac and cheese or tea or whatever it is, it takes forever to get it boiling. That's because you are just pouring the heat into that water and it just takes so long for its own temperature to change, okay? Um, so water can absorb or release large amounts of heat energy with little change in actual temperature. That's a good thing. Okay? That helps to regulate the temperature on our planet. It's really difficult to heat up the oceans and very difficult to cool them down again. Okay? So water resists changing its temperature. Okay? So you have to have everything on that slide, guys. You might be asking yourself this. Well, who cares about specific heat? Let me give you some examples here. Specific heat is the reason why we use water for cooling, okay, like in car radiators. Take a look at this diagram here. You all are getting to the age where you're going to be wanting to get driver's licenses, learner's permits, and um, I, I think you should have a basic understanding of what to do and what not to do with the engine of a car. That way you don't cause problems, like don't run a car when it's low on oil, okay, get that taken care of. If that little temperature gauge is getting up towards the H and it's rising, you need to stop the car, okay? So if we look over here, here's your engine, 
And right over here, this is your radiator. Okay. And what the radiator contains is water. Now we mix it with antifreeze in Pennsylvania because the water will freeze. But you know, if you're in a climate where it would never freeze, you could run just water through this. And as you can see, the water gets pumped through here. There's your water pump. And as you can see, the water gets moved through your engine block. And what it does, it grabs heat because water can absorb a tremendous amount of heat. Okay. And then as it comes up here, they all, there's some water that goes over here, and this is your heater core. That's why your car has to warm up before your heat will really warm you up uh, on a winter day. It kind of blows air through this hot water inside this heater core and then makes you warm inside the car. And then basically comes back around again. And as you're driving, wind blows through here, and it helps all this hot water to release some of its heat before it goes back in to grab more heat again. Okay, And you also have this fan right here that will blow air this way just to kind of move some air through that hot coil, the hot uh, radiator that's full of that hot water just to get rid of the heat, okay? We don't put water in there because it's cheap. We put it in there because it is so good at grabbing heat. It is so hard to change the temperature of water. It can absorb a ton of heat out of your engine, okay? Same thing with cooling a nuclear core up in this other picture. Water grabs so much heat, that's why we use it for cooling. Okay, another one is the reason why water temperatures don't fluctuate too much is air temperatures. Okay, you guys know that maybe this morning it was 30 degrees and it's going to get up to 50. Well, that fluctuated by 20 degrees. Water won't do that. If you have a swimming pool, if we're talking about the ocean, that temperature won't really budge. Okay, that's why if you want to go swimming, say you have a pool or something and you jump in in June, it's still freezing. Because it needs to get a lot of warmth and a lot of sunlight to budge the temperature of that water in your pool. The second part of this, okay, is the high heat of vaporization. This means to turn water into water vapor, okay? Here's the definition of heat of vaporization. So we're still under heat capacity, but this would be the second one under the heading of heat capacity. So maybe that should be a two. Amount of energy to convert one gram of a substance from a liquid to a gas. We're not changing the temperature. We're changing the phase of matter. Okay, I'll explain that to you in just a minute. In order for water, liquid water, to turn into steam and evaporate, you have to break the hydrogen bonds that are holding that water molecule to the other liquid water around it. Okay? And as you evaporate water, it takes a lot of heat with it. So let's just say you had... Um, water at 211 degrees. It's a liquid. Okay, and then the temperature goes up to 212. It's still a liquid. That's called specific heat. That's the heat needed to raise uh, one gram of water by one degree. It'd be Celsius, I know, but I'm just going to leave it here as Fahrenheit. The next step is to go to 212 but you're a gas. That's the heat of vaporization. Okay, you're not changing the temperature one bit, but you're changing the phase from a liquid to a gas. That's what we're talking about. Okay, and in order for water to do that, think about it, you have these water molecules, they have hydrogen bonds to another water molecule, Hydrogen bonds here. Okay, we'll kind of keep it simple. For this water molecule to evaporate and turn into a gas, you have to put so much energy in to break that hydrogen bond and to break that hydrogen bond. And it takes energy to do that. That energy is heat. So this will absorb heat, absorb heat, absorb heat until eventually you break that bond and you break that bond and now that one can go off and evaporate. Okay, so changing water from a liquid to a gas takes a lot of energy, okay? That's one reason why with a swimming pool, if you don't keep a solar cover on it overnight, it, your temperature really drops. It's called evaporative cooling. It means as water is evaporating out of your pool, it's taking heat out of the water to break those hydrogen bonds, and that's why it's cooling down so much. Um, same thing for sweating, okay? When you sweat, for that sweat to leave your body, 
it has to evaporate. When water goes from a liquid to a gas, it pulls heat out of your skin to get that energy to turn into a gas and get off of you. That's why sweating cools you down. Okay. Now, obviously, you're not 212 degrees. Okay. So water can evaporate just based on pressure differences and uh, things like that and humidity differences and things like that. It's not always, oh, yeah, I'm only 98.6. Why, why would it ever get off of me? Well, if it's very... Uh, low humidity around you, um, that's going to help to help that to evaporate off of you as well. Okay, so pressure differences, humidity differences, that all goes into helping it to evaporate off of you. Okay, so sweating cools the body by as that water leaves you, it takes um, heat with it. Okay, so we did cohesion was one, adhesion was two. Number three was capillary reaction. Number four was heat capacity. Number five, water is less dense as a solid. Remember, density is mass over volume. Okay, it's how much matter is packed into a space. Ice has less H2O in a certain space than does liquid water. So ice is less dense as a solid than as a liquid, and ice is going to float. Okay, so I have down here, there's more H2O molecules in a certain volume of water, because they can pack right next to each other, than in the same volume of ice. I'll show you a picture if you're more of a picture person to help understand that. Frozen water forms a very specific 3D structure called a crystal lattice, where one H2O has to have certain angles and certain distances from the H2Os around it in order to freeze. And what that does, when you set up that geometric shape with all these H2Os for it to freeze, what happens is there's some spaces in between those H2Os where there's nothing. It's not air. There's really nothing there. Um, and that's what happens. Let me show you a picture. If you look over here, this picture is water. Okay? So I would say the red is the oxygen. The white is the hydrogen. Guys, they're packed in there. All you see is red and white. Just all over each other and they're moving. I mean, this would be constantly in motion too because water's a liquid and liquids, the molecules have some motion to them. Over here is the ice, that's solid. And if you look, there are areas like right here where there is no H2Os, okay? So in that same volume, you have less H2Os because they have to set up this, this 3D pattern in order to freeze. And in doing that, the density is less. Okay, and guys, we'll practice this idea some more, uh, and I'll show you some videos about this. And um, if you ever heard something called flash freezing, where a bucket of water sits out and then someone bumps it, and you know the temperature dropped below 32, it would it would freeze instantly in like a second or two. And I'll show you a video about that, and we'll talk about it. But it has to do with this. Okay, so please make sure you write all of this down. And I do believe that was the last one. Okay. Don't expect you to completely understand every single thing that we said in this video, okay? We're going to do a lab with this stuff. We're going to watch some videos. We're going to practice this stuff, okay? After we start doing some of that stuff, keep looking through your notes, and if you're still not quite understanding, then we need to, I need to explain to you a different way. You have to let me know that, okay? All right, so guys, as always, please, please feel free to rewind. Watch parts again. Uh, make sure that your notes are accurate. You have everything in them. Uh, please email me with any questions that you have. Um, ask me during class. Uh, sign in during office hours, during study hall. And uh, we'll just keep on moving with some of this water chemistry.